Hello, church family. Well, it's Wednesday, and normally on Wednesday nights, we would have a Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. Naturally, we can't assemble as we would like to in person, but that doesn't mean we can't have a Wednesday night Bible study in a time of prayer. Uh, the good news is that so far, of all the people I've talked to, and I've tried to talk to dozens of people a week over the phone and via text message and email, and as far as I know, nobody from the church membership is presently in the hospital. Anybody who attends Calio Christian Church, to my knowledge, has not been sick. And so we are very fortunate, very grateful, and we'll never take that for granted. God is good. And so let's have a time of prayer right now. I'm going to invite you to pray with me. Take a few moments to shed everything else from your mind and to just bow in prayer and focus on the Lord. So let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we come before you right now, Lord, and we are so thankful for the many blessings that we have. God, I'm so grateful to hear from all the people in the church, as far as I know, who aren't sick, who are doing well, who, who during this time of uncertainty uh, that we're banding together and not only helping each other, but helping our community and reaching out. God, we are so blessed by those who have participated and who have gave to help out those efforts, that you have met all of our needs and continue to do so. Lord, we have faith that you will continue to do so because you are God and we will be still in this moment and recognize that fact. Uh, as we move forward, pray we will continue to be focused on you and your mission. Uh, we're thankful for all who are able to watch and listen online. So far we have had a tremendous response to that people who aren't even regular attendees are regularly watching and asking questions and that's just fantastic so thankful for them so God just again thank you for everything that we have and pray that we would not waste a moment doing anything other than what you want and receiving and trusting you for the blessings and we pray these things in your son's name amen all right now for a Bible study for Wednesday here I thought Let's do something that doesn't have anything to do with uh, quarantines in the Bible or lockdowns in the Bible. I've done those Bible studies the past couple of weeks, and you can see those online. Also, I'm willing to send a CD or a DVD to anybody who wants them. Before I get started into this Bible study, though, I want to warn you that I am recording from home. It is the late afternoon. I have two dogs. I have children. And just regular household noises. So if you hear things in the background, I apologize. Appreciate your patience there. But I also thought with regards to this Bible study, we're going to get away from sort of the current events. And, and this week for Wednesday, I'm going to tell you about all of the authors in the Bible that God inspired in like 20 minutes. I'm going to tell you who they are, and I'm going to tell you about them. And that will give you some insight as to when you're reading a certain Bible book uh, as to who these people were and why God chose them. Uh, I was uh, taught this, actually, and thought it was really profound that you could learn all of the uh, authors in the Bible and who they were and, and some reasons why maybe God chose them to write his inspired word. And so... I was taught this in a single lesson, thought it was amazing, thought it was fascinating. And so I took that material, expanded it a little bit, wrote it in my own style, and that's what you're going to hear today. So let's begin. Who wrote the first five books of the Bible? Well, Moses did. And who was he? Well, he was a man educated by Egyptian royalty, Acts chapter 7, verse 22. And we know a lot of other things about Moses as well, but I think it's interesting starting off that God chose somebody who obviously knew how to read and write who Stephen calls in Acts chapter 7 a man mighty in word and deed. Now, you might get the idea from Moses' excuses in Exodus chapter 3 that he was a poor speaker, but Stephen tells us the truth. Keep in mind, when Moses said that he was slow of tongue, he was trying to get out of the mission of going to Egypt. So, I'm not going to take Moses' excuse as the truth in that moment. But rather, Stephen, I am going to take as telling the truth, because he was under oath in court. He's a New Testament speaker here, preacher here, and he is telling us, hey, Moses was strong in word and deed, and nobody even contradicted him past that point or in the moment. So it was understood, both among the ancients and for those of us studying the Bible today, 
that Moses was really quite the educated man, quite a smart man, somebody that God chose to write the first five books of the Bible, the ones that are telling us about the whole world's origins, talking about how he would bring about his Messiah, the people of Israel, the patriarchs, the law. Those are things that all Moses shared with us, and so that's who he was. Now, who wrote the book of Joshua? Well, we presume, and virtually every Bible scholar agrees, that it was Joshua himself. And of course, he was a soldier. He was a leader. He was second in command under Moses in the latter years after Miriam and Aaron had died. And of course, therefore, he became an author in order to write this book. He led the children of Israel successfully, the second generation, to victory in Canaan and created the land of Israel under God's providence. And so that's who Joshua was. What's so interesting about Joshua, I think as well, is that before his first battle, he was not trained as a soldier. He learned war as he conducted it under Moses and under God's rule. And so Joshua was not just a soldier and a leader and an author. I'd have to say that's quite a brave man and a man of great faith. One of the best compliments given any man in scripture is recorded at the end of Joshua that says that Joshua's leadership was so influential and so godly that it was a whole generation after him that followed him as well. So the legacy of a godly leader can even outlive himself. So that's who wrote the book of Joshua. Who wrote Judges, Ruth, and First and Second Samuel? Well, all of those books were written by Samuel. And Samuel is an interesting character. He's the last judge and the first prophet of Israel. Uh, he uniquely wears those titles of being both the last judge and the first prophet of Israel. And he was educated in the temple from a boy. We know that his mother, Hannah, prayed to God and said, if you would give me a child, that I would dedicate him to your service. And that's precisely what he did. And so from 1 Samuel chapter 2 on, Samuel is raised in the temple and learns his role uh, as both the last judge and the first prophet of Israel. Uh, so much more to be said about Samuel. But it's interesting how he is a type of Christ in a way, a foreshadowing of Christ. Uh, so is Joshua, and, and so is Moses, of course. But Samuel, being a judge and a prophet, well, Jesus uniquely also was a judge and a prophet. Also a priest, which he was, you know, again, a, a last judge and a first prophet. But Jesus was both king and priest and prophet and judge. And so Samuel being sort of an incomplete foreshadowing, Jesus is the complete package. Samuel was the last judge, the first prophet, and a priest in Israel because he was under the tribe of Levi. So where Jesus supersedes Samuel is that he is judge and prophet and priest and king. And Samuel was not king. In fact, Samuel anointed kings. And so, again, Samuel has this preceding foreshadowing of who Christ would be, and then Jesus um, is the complete package. He is the fulfillment of that foreshadowing, of that typology. All right, now who wrote First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Jeremiah, and Lamentations? Uh, Jeremiah, he was a prophet and an author who wrote the longest book in the Bible. Now, there's a lot to say about Jeremiah, and he's a very important character in Scripture for all ages, because this poor guy was born into captivity and died in captivity. And he never saw a good day. He was born into the, the terrible times in Israel, and he died in the terrible times of Israel. And he was not valued by the world. Nebuchadnezzar came and took people from Israel four different times uh, in captivity and left Jeremiah behind every time. He thought Jeremiah was worthless. Well, God, whom the world saw as worthless, saw a man who could write the longest book or, yeah, the longest book in the most important book of the world for all time. Uh, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet because he wrote a book called Lamentations, which is a Hebrew word for sadness. And so if you need comfort in the sense that you need somebody who understands how you feel in Scripture, of course you have Christ. Uh, but you also have this Old Testament character, Jeremiah, who saw hope even in the darkest times, even when he himself never got to see hope uh, in this world. All right.
Ezra wrote the book named after him, Ezra, and he was a prophet. Uh, and Nehemiah, he was a man trained and served in the king's court. So I don't want to get too ahead of myself here. Uh, Ezra worked with Nehemiah. That's why I'm mentioning together these two men. Ezra was the priest, and Nehemiah was the man who would lead Israel back to their land and rebuild their walls and rebuild the temple. Uh, so those two books should be read in tandem together and understood together because you have one from the logistical perspective, which is Nehemiah, and one from the priestly perspective, which is Ezra. And they work together to rebuild Israel in anticipation of Christ's coming. Now, Nehemiah, he was not only trained and served in the king's courts, but he also wrote the book named after him. And most likely, he also wrote Esther. Esther is a really interesting book in the Bible because it's the only book that doesn't name God outright. But if you look at the Hebrew, God's name is in the acrostic. And what I mean by that is you look at the structure of how it is written in Hebrew. And on the left-hand side, if you read down instead of right to left, like you do in Hebrew, then you see God's name. And so it was possibly written that way in a sense to be a code. And the reason why, and I don't mean like the Bible code, like that silliness from the 90s. What I'm talking about is that they were being smart because there was persecution going on at the time. There was uh, the confiscation of material that the government viewed as propaganda. And so they might have wrote this story left out God's name in the literature, in the actual reading of the story, but put it in the acrostic as sort of a code to those who received it. Hey, this is still a document about and praising God. Uh, that's one theory. Uh, the Bible's most famous human king, David, who was also an accomplished musician, soldier, and poet, he wrote most of the Psalms. The world's wisest man uh, this, we know this from 1 Chronicles chapter 3 and 2 Chronicles chapter 1 was Solomon. And of course, they were father and son. And Solomon wrote most of the Proverbs, but not all of them. Uh, there's other kings that contributed to the Proverbs, and you can read about them as you read through the book of Proverbs. Uh, Solomon also wrote the book of Ecclesiastes, another super relevant book for our time that talks about how the pursuit of money and power and sex and authority is ultimately meaningless and what really gives your life meaning is bearing the responsibilities that God has given us, obeying his commandments and then everything else uh, benefits from that. Uh, he also wrote the Song of Solomon which is a love story. Uh, it's a love book, a love poetry. Uh, lots of interpretations with regards to the Song of Solomon. Uh, all good, not going to get into that today. Just wanted you to know that Solomon wrote that. Uh, I want to go back to David here for a second, his father. This author uh, of most of the Psalms, this is a man who, when he was writing the Psalms, you often think when you write a book, you write it all in a year or two or something like that. But the Psalms were published over time. And so uh, some of the earlier Psalms uh, talk about David's earlier life and his early experiences, and then it progresses. And so if you read David's Psalms uh, progressively, you can see how he changed as a person and how he saw God in the world. Uh, and it's just kind of an amazing aspect of the book of Psalms that I think is commonly over, uh, over it's just ignored, not talked about. Uh, then there is the book of Ezekiel, written by Ezekiel the prophet. Uh, he was a contemporary of Jeremiah. His book is over 50 chapters, so very long, near the size of Jeremiah, but not quite there. And what's so interesting about Ezekiel in comparison to his contemporary Jeremiah is that Ezekiel was respected even by his captives, the Babylonians, as greatly intelligent. Ezekiel even reports the fact that they thought so well of him in Ezekiel chapter 21, verses 19 through 21. So here you have these two men, think about this, that the world sees very differently, but God sees as equals and equally important. You have Jeremiah, who is despised by the world, but God still uses him. And then you have a man, Ezekiel, whom the world valued and used, but they respected one another. They both understood that God was the one who ultimately should receive the glory. Uh, so again, it's just so interesting 
how the world can view two men very differently, but God can see them as equally useful. And so you might be experiencing that sometimes where you don't know why the world values this person so much. Well, don't worry about that. God has a plan for you, just like he had a plan for Ezekiel and Jeremiah. It also goes to show you if you are successful in the world, don't ignore the mission God has for you and don't see your wealth as you are doing all you're supposed to be doing because the Bible doesn't say that God blesses the good and uh, unblesses the bad. Uh, in fact, un unblesses isn't a word. But <laughs> My point though is you can't view how you're doing in the world as whether or not God is showing you favor. You have God's favor when you obey his commands. That's it. And that has different worldly consequences for everybody. And so my point there is, is look at Ezekiel and Jeremiah, both equally faithful, but treated very differently by the world. All right, next is Daniel. Uh, Daniel was taught in the court of the kings from an early age, Daniel chapter one. And he was so revered by the kings that he served that he served five kings under two kingdoms in his lifetime. That's pretty amazing. So a very educated, very smart man wrote the book of Daniel. Uh, let's talk about the remaining prophets of the Old Testament. Sometimes these are called minor prophets, but it's not because they're unimportant, but just because their books are short, they're smaller in comparison to the other prophets. Uh, these were men who could read and write, which in their era meant they were educated, and it was very rare. Uh, literacy was rare in ancient times and was until relatively recently. We've only had widespread literacy in the world, really, and for the last 100 to 150 years. Uh, so these men were chosen by God. They wrote, they, they read, they understood what God wanted them to do, and they did it. And to this day, we have uh, their words and very grateful to have those words. Uh, let's go to the New Testament, Matthew. Uh, Matthew was a tax collector, obviously mathematically inclined. He was also literate. He could read and write, so a very smart and educated guy. But still, absolutely in need of Jesus. And that's what's so important to see here. And we get the perspective of Matthew, not only in his book, but from other books. And you have to sort of piece together information because he's not a major character in the narrative, uh, in the story, in the history. But here's a man who the world, again, valued. Now, he wasn't liked, he was a tax collector, but he was valued because he could read and write and he could do math and he could, you know, he served this role for the government. But he needed Christ, he knew he needed Christ, and he followed Christ. So uh, again, another great example uh, from this biblical author. John Mark, he was a long time disciple of the apostle Peter, and he wrote the book of Mark from Peter's perspective. And John Mark, as you know, was somebody that Paul didn't have faith in, but later on did, and Barnabas did from the beginning. And so the study of John Mark can show how maybe somebody in their youth has potential but isn't somebody people have confidence or trust in yet but over time can become that person so it goes to show us that just because we know somebody when they're younger and they were sort of a scoundrel or they were un unreliable we shouldn't always assume they're still that way we should look at a character like john mark and be like all right people deserve another chance later on and hopefully they've grown up like john mark did and wrote one of the gospels so what an accomplishment again glory to god well luke of course he was a doctor he was a missionary companion, an author. He could read and write, and he could treat people. Very valued by the Apostle Paul, and through God's providence and to his glory again, uh, Luke was an author of one of the Gospels. Well, of course, there's the Apostle John, uh, and he was uniquely labeled the disciple that Jesus loved. They had a special, very close friendship. Uh, John wrote five books of the New Testament. He wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, and the Book of Revelation. He also lived the longest of all the apostles. Of course, there's the apostle Paul. Paul originally was a Pharisee. He was trained in the finest of Jewish schools under the revered teacher Gamaliel. We know this from Acts chapter 22, verse 3. Uh, and he also spent three years in the desert training under Jesus. This is a fact that is often left out uh, when talking about Paul. But he had this time with Jesus, just like the other disciples, just, just out of time, as Paul describes it. This is... Uh, told to us by him in Galatians chapter 1 verses 11 through 23. And so that's really worth understanding that God invested a tremendous amount in this previous church persecutor and murderer 
and gave him the same education the other disciples did, picked a man who already was educated, who could obviously read and write very well, and he ended up writing nearly half of the New Testament. Again, glory to God. So there you go. There are your biblical authors in 20 minutes. Woo! Boy, if you know me, that is quite an accomplishment. <laughs> normally very wordy and take forever to explain things and you know I can do a whole a Bible study on one half of one verse but I did not subject that to you today so you know enjoy this short lesson definitely not my cup of tea but I thought you know let's do something different something that doesn't have anything to do with current events and you just learned a tremendous amount about every author in your Bible in 20 minutes and again I don't take credit for that this lesson was something shared with me I merely took it, rewrote it in my own style, and taught it to you. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, thank you for joining me this Wednesday. Uh, I will be preparing a Sunday school lesson for this week, as well as a sermon as usual, and I will catch you soon. God bless.